Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to be covering event procedures in Excel VBA. So the video is all about how to write code which runs itself automatically in response to certain events in the life of your workbook. So we'll start by talking about how you can access the events of an object and we'll stick to workbooks and worksheets to begin with. We'll then talk about how you add the code to an event procedure and then how you can make that code run by triggering the event that it's attached to. We'll make a quick mention of security, which is quite important when you're talking about events, and a couple of useful things you can do in terms of cancelling and disabling certain events as well. Once we've covered all the basics, we'll go through a few more practical examples of actual events you can use. So we'll talk about opening and closing workbooks, printing and saving files, inserting worksheets, and then selecting and changing cells, which are some of the more common things you're likely to be using in terms of events in Excel. So there's quite a lot to do, let's get started. In Excel VBA, an event procedure is simply a subroutine which runs automatically in response to an event in the workbook. So for example, when the workbook gets opened up or closed down, when somebody inserts a new worksheet or clicks on a cell in a worksheet, those are all examples of events which can have subroutines attached to them. For the first simple example, we'd like to make a welcome message appear on screen whenever somebody opens up the workbook. And to do that, I need to get access to the code behind the workbook object. So the first slightly unusual thing about events is that when you're coding them, you don't code them in a normal module, as you ordinarily would in a certain module at this point. Instead, you simply need to view the code of the object whose events you want to access. And in this case, it's an event of the workbook object. So you can view its code in a couple of ways. You can right-click on it and choose a view code, or even more simply, just double-click this workbook, and that will open up the code view of that object. So notice we don't actually have an extra module here. We don't even have the modules folder in the Object Explorer, even though this looks very much like a module. This is the code view of the workbook object. OK, so to access the events of this object, you don't need to make up a name for the subroutine that you want to create. Instead, you use the drop-down lists at the top of the code window to select the event you want. So start with the one at the left-hand side and choose the object that you're coding for. So I'm going to choose Workbook is the only other choice. That will automatically generate the default event for this object. And for the workbook, it's actually the one that we want. It's the open event of the workbook object. However, if you wanted a different event, and we will come back to some other events later on in the video, you can use the drop-down list at the top right-hand corner and see the full list of events that have been defined for that particular object. We'll come back to them though, some of those later on. For now, all I'd like to do is write the subroutine that I want to, um, to execute whenever the WISP workbook opens up. And as I said, all I want to happen is a simple message box to appear that welcomes the user to the workbook. So you could say, um, I don't know, hello. Um, and maybe we'll use the username of the person who's running this subroutine or who's opening the workbook. So you can use the environ function and use the username parameter. And maybe we can put in the title of the message box. We could put in today's date. So I'll put the use the date function to populate the title parameter. So there we go, a simple message box which appears whenever the user opens up the workbook. The next job is to test whether this subroutine works when it's supposed to. So when you're testing event procedures, you shouldn't just simply choose to run them by clicking the Run button or pressing F5. You need to trigger the event that the procedure is attached to. So that means I need to save my code and my workbook. I'm going to close down the VB editor. Then I'm going to close down the workbook that the event is attached to. That means that I can use the File menu to reopen the workbook and trigger the open event. Now, depending on your macro security settings, you may also need to choose to enable the macros. And I can do that in this version of Excel by clicking the Enable Content button based on my security settings. And as soon as I do that, my open event procedure is triggered and it runs any code stored inside it. So there we go, a very simple example of a basic event procedure. Just before we go any further talking about events, I want to make a quick mention of macro security. And as you've just seen, when I opened up my workbook, I had to choose to enable my macros before my event procedure would run. And the reason I had to do that is all down to the level of security that I currently have set for Excel. If you want to see or change the macro security levels, head to the Developer tab in the ribbon and click Macro Security. That will take you to the slightly ominous sounding Trust Center, and it shows you the four levels of macro security for Excel. The one I currently have set, Disable All Macros with Notification, means that whenever you open a file containing macros, by default they will not work, unless you choose to enable them, and that's what the notification part is. 
that's probably the most sensible choice because it means if you're opening up files from people whom you don't know perhaps or you're not sure what code is stored in the workbook you can choose to leave macros disabled when you open the workbook have a look at the code in the VB editor, verify that it's safe, and then choose to enable them later on. There is an option a bit further down the list here called Enable All Macros, which sounds really convenient. Whenever you open up a workbook which contains macros, the macros will just run automatically without you having to have any say in it. But it also mentions here that it's not recommended because potentially dangerous code can run. Now we're not going to write any dangerous code in our open event procedure in this video, but it is possible that somebody malicious could write uh, some dangerous code, could do all sorts of horrible things to your computer. Um, and if you had this setting enabled, then that code would run automatically almost without you knowing about it. So do be careful about which level of security you have set. This one that I currently have here, disable all macros with notification, is pretty much the most sensible pragmatic choice. So I'm going to hit OK or Cancel, I haven't changed anything so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then we can get on with looking at some more events. So we've already seen the open event for the workbook. Let's have a look at the opposite event when the workbook gets closed down. Back to the Visual Basic Editor, and we're already in the code for the This Workbook object. So what I need to do again is select the appropriate event from the drop-down list at the top. If I go to the top left, I could choose Workbook. Or alternatively, if I've already generated an event procedure for the workbook, I can just click somewhere inside that event procedure and it automatically selects that one for me. Then I can use the drop down list at the top right to choose the new event. And this time the event is called before close. So I'm going to select that one from the list and that will generate the event procedure for me. It doesn't matter what order these go in, by the way, the event procedures only work when the event happens, so it genuinely doesn't matter what order they appear in, they're actually listed alphabetically as it turns out. So what should we do with the close event? Let's do the same thing we did for the welcome message. We'll have another message box which says um, goodbye, just to demonstrate when this event procedure actually runs. So again I'm going to save the code, close down the VB editor, and then I'm going to close down the workbook. And we should see as soon as we choose to do that, that the goodbye message appears. So I can click OK, and then I can reopen the workbook choose to enable my content and I get the welcome message as well. So not a massively practical example but it demonstrates clearly that the different event procedures occur at different times. One interesting feature of the before close event is that it has its own parameter called cancel as boolean meaning it can be true or false. So this is an example of an event which can be cancelled. Now ordinarily you would do that on a conditional basis but just as a silly example and to demonstrate how the cancel parameter works. I'm going to change what my message says from goodbye to you're not leaving. Then immediately after the message box has appeared, I'm going to set the cancel parameter equal to true. Which means that every time I try to run the event, i.e. close down the workbook, that event will be cancelled. If I just save what I've done there so far and head back to Excel, and I can choose to try to close down the workbook, and I'm told I'm not leaving, and then the event is cancelled. And that's true if I try to close down Excel as well. If I head to the file menu and choose close, head to the file menu and choose exit, try double clicking in the top left hand corner, or if I press the keyboard shortcut Alt and F4, there's no way to get out of the workbook, basically other than using the task manager to end the Excel task. So um, not necessarily a practical example, although it's a great way to play a joke on people who are using your workbooks, but I didn't tell you that. Shh. Um, ordinarily, of course, you would do this on a conditional basis, so there may be some sort of condition under which you do not want to allow a user to close down the workbook. Just for the sake of argument, let's say we wanted to keep the workbook open until a particular time of day. So I can add an if statement above my message box which says if hour of now, so the hour is a function which generates the or returns the hour of a time and now returns the time as it stands when the code runs. So if the hour of now is less than 17, then, so this will check if I've reached 5 p.m. during the day, of course. Um, make sure I put my end if statement in there as well. So if the time is before 5 p.m. during the day, then my event gets cancelled. So I can save that. Now currently the time is, according to my system clock, is 8.02 a.m. So if I head back to Excel and I try to close down the workbook, because it is before 5 p.m., I can't leave. But if I head back to the VB editor and I change this to say, let's say if the hour is before 8, then I'm not leaving. Then because it's already 8am in the morning, 
when I save this, go back to Excel and choose to close it, then it will allow me to close the workbook. So that's how it works on a conditional basis. Let's get back into the file menu and choose to open that workbook again, enable my macros, see my welcome message, and just back to the code. So ordinarily you would cancel events on a conditional basis. Now the close event isn't the only one that can be cancelled, there are several other ones as well. If I go back to the drop down list at the top right hand corner, I can see there's a before print event. If I select that one, it shows me there's a, there's a parameter called cancel as boolean. So I could choose that whenever somebody tries to print the workbook, I could say you can't print this file. And then cancel equals true. Again, you might do that on a conditional basis, perhaps test the person who's choosing to print it using the environ function. So if the username is not WiseAl, then you can't print the workbook, for instance. But again, if I save this, head back to Excel and choose to print it. When I click that print button, I'm told that I can't print this file, and then the event gets cancelled. One more quick example, just to round off this little set of, um, of before events. There's an event called before save, and you can probably guess when that happens. Um, it's a little bit more complex because it has an extra parameter called save as UI. I'm not going to deal with that here. I'm interested again in the cancel parameter. So if you wanted to prevent people from saving this particular file, you can tell them that's the case. You can't save this. And then cancel equals true. Again, that might be done on a conditional basis, so testing who the person is, or what day of the week it is, or I, I, you can think of many, many conditions under which you might not want to save a workbook. But now that I've written that code, even if I choose to save it in the VB editor, I'm told that I can't save the workbook, and then the, the, uh, the event is cancelled. So there you go, three events in a workbook that you can choose to cancel. So far, all of our examples have been quite simple. Essentially, we've just been displaying messages on screen when events have been triggered. But your event procedures can be much more complex than that. In fact, they can be as long and complex as any other subroutine you might have written in a normal code module. When you are writing more complex procedures for your events, you do need to be a little bit careful about exactly what you do in those events. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to show you another event called the new sheet event. First of all, I'm going to get rid of all my before Event. So before close, print and save, I'm going to del delete those just to tidy up a little bit. Then back to the list at the top right hand corner, I'm going to find and select the new sheet event. And this is triggered every single time you create a new sheet or a new chart sheet. So again, there's another parameter for this particular event, which is called sh as object. So this stores a reference to the object which, which has been created. And what I'd like to do for this particular event is, if a user chooses to insert a worksheet, I'd like to ask them how many worksheets they would like to include. Because normally when you insert a worksheet, you have to do it one at a time. So this system will ask the user how many they want to include, and will insert more worksheets in the same event. So to do that, I'll need a variable which can store how many worksheets the, the user wants. So I'm going to call it how many, and that's going to store an integer. And then I'm going to store a value in that variable using an input box. So how many equals input box, and I'm going to say how many sheets would you like. Okay, so what I'd like to do then is, depending on how many um, worksheets the user has asked for, I'm going to say worksheets.add, and if I type in a space after that, I can type in a couple of commas to get to the count parameter. Alternatively, I can just type in count colon equals to jump straight there. And the number of worksheets I would like to add is equal to how many minus one. Because we've already inserted one worksheet by triggering this event, I want to insert the remaining worksheets that the user has asked for. Now if you think about what this will do, if we've inserted a worksheet and that triggers the new sheet event, then if we write some code to add some worksheets, then that also triggers the new sheet event. So for each sheet that gets added, every single time we do that, it will trigger this event again. So you'll end up in this sort of almost like a circular reference, like a cascading event that the code you've written in the event triggers itself again. So what we would want to do to make sure that that does not happen is within this event, before we write or execute the code that triggers the event again, we want to make sure that the events have been disabled. And we can do that with the statement application.enableEvents 
equals false. Once you've successfully completed the instruction, adding those extra worksheets without triggering the same event, we can say application.enableEvents equals true, and then events will be re-enabled the next time a user chooses to add a worksheet. Whew. So if I save that, head back to Excel, and I click on the New Sheet button down here to insert a new sheet, I'm asked how many sheets would I like. So I've already inserted one there. If I say I wanted three worksheets in total, then I'll get a further two worksheets added. And because I've disabled my events while that happens, it means that each time I insert a new sheet, I don't get asked again how many more sheets would I like. So, as I was saying, this is something you do have to be a little bit more careful of when you're writing more complex event procedures. Make sure that the code that you're writing doesn't accidentally trigger either the same event or another event that you didn't intend. The other thing that we have to be careful of with this particular event is that it's triggered not just when you insert a new worksheet, but also if you insert a new chart sheet as well. And I want to make sure that I only get asked if how many worksheets I want to add if I insert a worksheet, not a chart. So to do that, I can add an if statement using the sh parameter. So sh stores a reference to the object that's been created, whether that's a worksheet or a chart. So what I can do is say if type of sh is worksheet, then do all these lines. I'm going to indent those and then make sure I end my if statement afterwards. So this will only happen now if I insert a worksheet and not a chart. So again, several things to consider when you're writing more complex code in an event procedure. Understanding first of all when your event happens, as well as making sure that it doesn't accidentally trigger the same event again. So now that we've seen a few workbook events, let's have a look at a few worksheet specific events. To get to the events of a worksheet, it's a lot like getting to the events of a workbook. I'm going to go for Sheet 2's events, and to see them, I need to double-click on the Sheet 2 object in the Project Explorer. That will open up the code page for the Sheet 2 object. It's worth mentioning I could also do that from Excel as well. If I switch into Excel and I find Sheet 2 and right-click on it, I can choose to view its code, and that will take me to exactly the same place. And then, just as we did with a workbook, to see the events, I can select from the top left drop-down list, Worksheet, that generates the default event for the worksheet. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then the drop-down list at the top right shows you all of the other events you could access. And if you wanted a different one, you could just click on its name. But I'm actually interested in the, the default event for a worksheet, which is called Selection Change. And it has a parameter called Target as Range. So this event gets triggered every single time you change the selection on the worksheet, i.e. you click on a different cell. Um, the cell or cells that you've selected get stored in the target parameter, or a reference of the cells gets stored in the target parameter at least. So if we wanted to do something to the cell or cells that have been selected, we can reference them by using that keyword. So as a very simple first example, what I would like to do is every time I select a different cell, I want to change the interior color property to be equal to VB yellow. So it's a nice, simple, straightforward example, not particularly practical, again, but it demonstrates how this event works. So once I've written that code, I can switch back into Excel, I need to make sure that I'm on Sheet 2, because the code I've written is specific to that worksheet. If I head to Sheet 3, nothing will happen at all when I click on a cell. But on Sheet 2, if I click on a different cell, that cell will change its interior colour to VB yellow. At the moment, any single cell or block of cells that I select across the entire worksheet will have their background colours changed. But sometimes when you're using the selection change or its related change event, which we'll encounter shortly, you will want to restrict the range of cells over which your changes take place. So for instance, let's say we only wanted to be able to change the color of a cell if we click on a cell between cells A1 and E10, anywhere in that block at all. If we click outside of that range, then we don't want anything to happen. If we click inside, we want the cell color to change. We can do this using the target parameter and checking which row and column the target is in and if it exceeds the range we're after, making sure we don't actually apply any changes. So if I head back to the VB editor, we can add an if statement to our procedure, which will say if target.row is less than or equal to 10 and target.column is less than or equal to 5 then make my colour change, I put in the end if statement, and then indent the code inside the if. So now this 
action will only take place if the target cell we've selected is below row 10 or above row 10 I suppose and uh, to the left of column 5 which is column E. So if I go back to Excel and if I click on a cell outside that range nothing will happen at all but as soon as my cell my target is within the block A1 to E10 then the colors will start to change again. We do have one other small problem here as well, and that is if we start selecting a block of cells that exist inside the range, but then extend the selection outside of our restricted range, then unfortunately all the cells get coloured in. So if we wanted to make sure that the cells we're colouring in were only living inside the range A1 to E10, then what we could do is loop over all of the cells in the collection of cells that we select in the target, and individually evaluate each one. So to do that we can go back to the VB editor and we can add a loop to our procedure. You may have seen the video we've created previously about looping over collections and if not now would be a good time to go and watch it I guess. Um, I'm going to declare a variable called single cell as a range and then I'm going to say for each single cell in target. Further on down I'm going to close my loop by saying next single cell and then just indent all of the code between those two lines just to clearly indicate where the loop begins and ends. Okay so if this loop will essentially break down the target into its individual component cells and evaluate each one in turn but I also have to change where I'm referencing the target here. I want to check the target row and the target column. What I want to do is check the row and column of the single cell. So I'm going to replace the word target with single cell there and there and finally here as well. So now that I've made those changes if I go back to Excel and I'm just going to make sure that I've cleared the contents of these cells. So while they're all still selected I'm going to clear the formatting or I'm just going to clear all and again if I click in a single cell inside the range no problem. Click on single cells outside the range or blocks of cells outside the range no problem and again if I now select a block of cells which begins in the range but then extends outside of it, we'll find that it's only the cells inside the range which get affected. Looping over the individual cells in the target allows us to evaluate each single cell one by one, but it does introduce another small problem to our program, and that is the bigger the target we select, the longer the subroutine will take to run. Because there are more cells involved, it has to evaluate each cell one by one, it will take longer to do. So an alternative approach, rather than trying to process each cell one by one, is we could check how many cells the user has selected, and only perform an action if they've selected a single cell. So to do that, I'm going to go back to the VB editor again, and I'm going to remove my loop code that evaluates all my single cells. And I'm going to change the... Uh, the single cells back to the word target, like so. And instead, I want to wrap another if statement around this. I want to check if the number of cells in the target is equal to 1. And if that is true, then I'll check if it's within the range I'm interested in. And only if those conditions have all been met will I change the color. So I can do this by checking the count of the cells in the target. So I can say literally if target.cells.count equals 1. Then indent the lines below, don't forget my end if, and then I can go back to my Excel spreadsheet and I can try clicking on single cells. So if I'm clicking on single cells outside the range nothing will happen. Click on a single cell inside the range and it will change colour, but if I select a block of cells inside the range nothing will happen at all because the count of the cells in my target is not equal to 1. Now there is one last thing that you need to be quite careful of if you're using this technique of counting the number of cells in the selection. And it's only really applicable if you're working in Excel 2007 or later, but if you try to select all of the cells in the worksheet having used the count property, you'll find that it will fail with an overflow error. If you hit the debug button, it will show you that it's the, the line that's trying to count the cells that has failed. And the reason for this, if I just reset my subroutine, the reason for this is the count property returns its value as a long integer. And a long integer has a maximum limit of about 2.147 billion. 
Now, with the increased worksheet size in Excel 2007 and later, you've got about 17.14 billion cells per worksheet, which far exceeds the upper limit of a long data type. So what Excel have done, what Microsoft have done in fact, have they've provided a different property when you're trying to count large numbers. They've eventually called it count large. So if I change count to count large, then that will allow me back in the VB, uh, sorry, back in Excel to select all of the cells in the worksheet and for it not to fail. So again, I can select single cells in my outside the range and it won't work, single cells inside the range and it will work, multiple cells in the range and it won't work, and the inside worksheet, and again, it won't change all the colors of those cells. So as I say, just one more thing to be wary of, if you're in Excel 2007 or later, use the count large property rather than count to avoid that sort of problem. Okay, so now that we've dealt with the selection change event in quite a lot of detail, I want to talk about a related event called change. I'm going to do this on a different worksheet. So I'm going to head to the sheet three object this time, double click. I want to see the events for the worksheet. So I'll use the drop down list at the top left to choose worksheet and then use the drop down list at the top right to choose the new event I want, which is called change. I can then delete the selection change event. I won't need that for the moment at least. And then let's have a look at the change event. So this is triggered every time you change the value of a cell on a worksheet. And it's got a similar parameter to select and change called the target as range. And this references the cell or cells that have just been changed. What I'd like to do on sheet three is if a value ever gets added or modified in a cell, I want to record that change in a comment. So the comment will always store information about the last change made to that cell. So in a simple way, I can do that by saying target.addComment and I'll put into the comment the date and time that it happened using the now function and then sticking a dash to separate that from the actual value of the cell, target.value and another ampersand and another dash in between that and the person who made the change in the first place. So and environ username. Okay, so now that I've done that, if I head back into Excel and I head onto sheet three and I type a value into a cell, hit enter, and I'll find that, that cell has a comment added to it, which tells me what value was added, what date and time it happened, and who did it. I've got a small problem though that if the cell already contained a comment, if I try to modify the value in this cell now and, and, and hit enter, then the code fails because it's trying to add a comment to a cell which already has one. So I need some sort of if statement to check if the cell already has a comment, do something different. To do that, I can use an if statement to check if the target cell's comment is nothing. So I can say if target.comment is nothing, then, and only then, add a comment. Don't forget my end if. So now if I go back to my Excel spreadsheet and I try to type something into a cell which does already have a comment, then I don't get the error. But unfortunately, it doesn't record the change that I've made. So if I go back to the VB editor, what I can do now is add an else clause to my if statement. So I can say, if the target cell already does have a comment, then I can say target dot comment dot text. So I can use the text method to change the text stored in the comment. What we'll do first of all is just replace the text that's already there. And all I need to do in order to make that work is say what new value I want to place into the cell. So I'm just gonna use exactly the same expression as I've used here. Use the now function, target.value, and the username. So I'm gonna copy that and paste it to the end of that statement. Okay, so now that I've done that, back to Excel. And if I pick a brand new cell and type in hello, that adds a new comment. If I select the same cell again and type in a new word, hit enter, it replaces the previous comment with the new one. Now it's also possible to build up a list of changed items. So rather than just replacing the text that's already there, I can actually add the new information to the end of the current list. That's a little bit more complicated, but let's have a look back in the VB editor. The text method in fact, let me break this down into separate lines. So target.comment.text, I'm gonna put in a, a, a new line character, so a space and an underscore, and now I can bring this comment down to the next line, okay? What I can then do is again, at the end of that line, I can type in a space and an underscore, and come down to the next line again, and type in a comma. And you can see that takes me to the second parameter 
of the text method, which is called start. What this wants to know is it wants to know the number of the character to begin writing the new text at. So every text string is indexed. Each individual character in the string has an index number. What I want to do is I want to find the length of the full, complete, current text. So if I say len, which is a function which returns the length of a string of text, I need to tell it to find, find the length of target.comment.text. Then I need to add one to the result of len, which means that my new string of text will be added one character after the complete length of the existing comment text. Phew. Um, one more um, parameter to provide, and that's the overwrite parameter. So if I, so, excuse me, I've got the, uh, the space and the underscore. On the next line, then, I can start with another comma. And the overwrite parameter, I want to set that to false. So don't replace what is already there. OK, nearly there. One last thing to do. At the moment, my new comment text will be added just directly at the end of the existing comment text. And what I'd really like to do is put in at least one new line character between the old comment and the new comment. So in the first parameter of my text method, I'm going to add on a VB new line character to the beginning of that concatenated string. Phew, right, I think we're there. So having done all of that, what I can do now is head back to Excel and let's pick a blank cell to begin with just to make sure that that part still works. If I type it into a new cell, I get a brand new comment. If, however, I go back to that same cell and type in a new word and hit enter, then the comment is modified, but you can see that it's added actually a new entry into the comment rather than just overwriting what was already there. One final problem that we have to solve with this example is if I try to change the value of multiple cells at the same time. So for instance, if I try to select these this block of cells and press the delete key to remove the contents of the cells, the subroutine will fail again because you can't add or change comments on multiple cells all at the same time. So it fails the very first time it tries to add a new comment. So what I can do now is one or two things. We can either change the way the program works so that if we've selected or changed more than one cell, then this subroutine doesn't work at all, so we just circumvent this section of code. Or we could loop over the collection of cells that we're changing and add or change the comment for each individual cell one by one. Let's add the loop in, shall we? So we can see how this will work. Again, bearing in mind that, that the loop can potentially slow down these subroutines. The bigger the target you select, the, uh, the slower your code will run. But I'm going to do it by saying dim single cell as range and then say for each single cell, let spell that properly, in target. Right down to the bottom then, I've got to finish my loop by saying next single cell. And then just for the sake of tidying up, I'm going to indent all these lines of code inside the loop. Once again, I need to be able to change my the word target here, and I've got several places where I have to change the word target. So what's probably the easiest thing to do is to select all of that text and press the Control H keyboard shortcut to bring up the Find Replace dialog. You can also do that from the uh, from the Edit menu as well, of course. So I'm going to say Find Target and replace with Single Cell, and I want to make sure that that only happens in the selected text. Then I'm going to click Replace All. And I get six replacements made. I can close that window down and then I can test if this thing works again. So if I go back to Excel and let's try adding some, con some words to some cells. So hello, um, my, um, yes, no, that will do. So all those cells have been selected and edited one by one. So those are all the comments. Now if I selected all the cells in one go and I press delete, the program now handles that because it loops over each cell and treats each one individually, bit by bit. Um, if I try to add multiple values to cells as well, so if I select a block of cells and I type in a word and then press Control and Enter, you'll see that that populates all the cells at the same time, but it adds a comment individually, one by one by one by one to all the cells. Again though, as I said, bear in mind that looping over the collection of cells in the target 
is not necessarily a great idea because it can slow down the way your subroutine works. I guess what you could do is combine this with a count. So we could say if target.cells.countLarge is greater than, let's put an arbitrary number of 1000 on it. If that's true, then what we could do is just exit the sub at that point. Oh, I've got my then keyword. I've been into SQL Server recently. I forgot my then. So if the target cells count large is greater than 1000, then exit the sub. So if I had selected a ridiculous large number of cells, then this loop wouldn't work, so it wouldn't slow down the subroutine. But of course, then you wouldn't get the addition of the comments. It's a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? One of those things you sort of have to consider every time you um, you do something like this. You have to work out whether or not the the trade-off in looping over the collection of cells is worth it to get the extra functionality of your event. But I'll leave that sort of decision up to you. One final tweak we'll make to this subroutine is to add a line which automatically changes the comment text box so that you can read the full comment, because at the moment you can't. If I go back to Excel and hover the mouse over one of these cells, you might just be able to make out that part of the comment text is hidden below the bottom edge of the text box. So we're going to add another line, if I go back to the Visual Basic Editor, I'm going to add another line at the end of the for each loop that will change the size of the single cell's comment text box. So regardless of whether I've added a brand new comment or just edited an existing one, I want to make sure that the comment box is the right size. So I'm going to do this outside of the if statement, but still within the loop. I'm going to say single cell dot comment dot shape dot text frame dot auto size equals true. So once I've done that, head back to Excel and I'm going to try changing the value of one of these cells, one which already has a comment to begin with. So you can see that at the moment I can't see the entire comment. If I just type anything in at all and hit enter, when I hover the mouse back over that comment, you can see it's much more neatly formatted and it's much easier to see what's been done and when. And that will work again if I add a comment to another brand new blank cell as well. Hovering the mouse shows you a nicely sized comment for the value that you're trying to display. For the final part of the video, I wanted to quickly mention some of the other objects you can draw on a worksheet that actually add to the events you can code for in the code page. So at the moment in the VB editor for sheet 3, if I click on the drop down arrow at the top left hand corner, I can only select between general and worksheet. So worksheet is the only object here that has events. If I go back to Excel, however, and I decide that I wanted to draw another object like a command button, for instance, from the developer tab in the ribbon, I can choose the insert option. And if I use the active X controls section at the bottom half of this, this drop down list, I can draw a command button by clicking on it and then clicking and dragging on the background of the spreadsheet. So that object now exists as um, an item with events in the sheet three code module. If I right click on the background of sheet on the, on the Sheet 3 tab and choose View Code to go back to the VB Editor, I'll see that not only do I have Worksheet listed here at the top, but I also have something called Command Button 1, which is the object that I've just drawn. Now at the moment, I've still got the Command Button 1 object selected in the background in Excel. If I just quickly switch back, you can see that it's selected. And it has a current name called Command Button 1, which is a bit of a rubbish name. So while it's still selected, you can see the Properties window in the VB Editor allows you to change its name. So I'm going to call this BTN clear comments and that gives you a fairly good idea of what I'm about to do with it. So if I want to access the events of that object now I can do it in the same way that I would for a worksheet. If I select button clear comments from the list it generates the default event for that object which happens to be the one I want again It's the click event but there's a bunch of other events for this button as well. So there's all sorts of things that can bizarrely happen in the life of a button. You can make something happen when you double click on it or when you move the mouse cursor over it, or when you press the mouse button down or let the mouse button go back up, and so on and so on. So it's exactly the same as coding events for a workbook or a worksheet. Pick the event you want and type the code into the appropriate procedure. All I would like to do for this button is make it so that whenever I click it, we clear the comments for all of the cells on the worksheet. And we can do that by applying the clear comments method to the cells property. So. Once I've done that, I can head back to Excel. 
I need to activate this button and I can't just do that by clicking away from the button and then clicking back on it. When you draw ActiveX controls, the, the Excel goes into something called design mode, which lets you select buttons and move them around and reposition them without accidentally triggering the code that's still behind them. So if I want to come out of design mode to see if my button works, I have to click the design mode button and then this time when I click on the button, it will actually perform the action. If I want to make any further changes to the button, I have to go back into design mode so that I can select it and then I could maybe make some more changes to its properties, like maybe I want to change the caption of the button. So the best place to do that is in the VB editor and I can find the caption property of the button and change that so it says clear comments. So there we go. Um, the fact that you can draw other objects on a spreadsheet, on a worksheet, that then add further to the events you can code for. And they all work in conjunction as long as you've program programmed everything neatly. Everything should work beautifully in conjunction with everything else. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.